Amen, amen, amen. Um, if you're a Bible person, open up your Bible or your smartphone app or however uh, you get into the Bible. I want you to open it this morning to Genesis chapter 1. How appropriate on uh, January 1st we're in Genesis 1, amen? Uh, we're going to start at the beginning, at the beginning, literally. Um, so there's a, there's a core uh, truth that I want to communicate to this church this morning, and it is a foundational truth for the Christian life. It is what is underneath all of our values as Christians. This is what's underneath our entire morality. Anything that you would say, this is right and this is wrong, this is moral, this is immoral, all of it sits on this one foundation. And we're going to read about it. We're going to read where it comes from this morning. I'll also tell you that when, as a pastor, I've ministered to people over the years and met with people over the years, I experience a lot of people that have experienced hurt. And there are hurts that we experience, but there are hurts that haunt us. Yes? There are hurts that haunt us. And when I speak with people about the hurts that haunt them. I always find myself, and I mean this very literally, not embellishing it, I always find myself coming to this exact passage for them. Because this is the truth that helps people in the midst of that broken identity. People who have been spoken um, against, they've been manipulated, they've been groomed in a particular way that has brought them low, that has set them on a course where they believe they're nothing. Some of you have been there. And God comes against that you're nothing in a very specific way. And so this foundational truth is not only what you need for you today, this is what you need to teach to your children. If you're group leaders today and Bible study teachers in our church, you need to teach this to the people that you mentor. When I was in seminary, my final senior year research project was on this topic. And the more I went deep into this topic, it changed me, it changed my whole outlook. So there's going to be a lot of Bible study this morning. If you were a note taker, you should take notes this morning because mentally you are going to want to come back. And if you were not a note taker this morning, some of you know what I'm going to say. You should definitely take notes this morning because some of this you're going to wonder, how did he connect this dot to this dot to this dot? And it's going to move a little bit fast and be a little bit of a whirlwind. And you're going to want to see those connections. They're very important. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 is where we'll start. This is in the midst of the creation narrative. And like last week when we talked about Bethlehem, I do not say the creation story because the creation story implies once upon a time. And this is not once upon a time. This is in space and time and in history. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And this is, this is part of the creation narrative. And God has already said, let there be light. And he's already created the planets and the universe. He's already created um, all the plants and the seas and, and, and he's created the sun and the moon and the stars. All of that has already been created. And then he gets to day six and he creates animals and he creates mankind. And when he creates mankind, he creates them special. And you see special right here. What does special mean? He creates mankind in his image and in his likeness. This is a massive verse. Theologians call this in the image of God, in the likeness of God. They use a Latin phrase for it. They call it the Imago Dei. Say Imago Dei. The Imago Dei. 
in the image of God, that every single person breathing today has been made in the image of God. And because you've been made in the image of God, that means certain things about you. And I'll just say briefly, notice that nothing else in creation has been made this way. And some of you are big animal people, and we've got a puppy at home right now. I talked about that last week, and we're big animal people, and I totally get that. But animals are not image bearers of God. Animals are glory bearers of God. They bear his glory like, like works of art. They, they, they bear an imprint of the master's hand, but they do not bear his image the way that men and women are image bearers of God. We're a chip off the old block. We resemble him. That's messing with some of you already. Wait, wait a second. Does that mean I've got eyes, the, the, like the eye color of God? Does that mean like I've got the hair color of God? It's not that kind of uh, resemblance. Because God is spirit, the scripture tells us. So the physical characteristics that we have are not necessarily tied to any physical characteristics of God. It means something more and it means something much more deep. There's a resemblance there and and the theologians don't even know what this means exactly. But there's a resemblance there. It's it's his character. It's his personality. There's, There's very, very specific qualities and power that God has that he's passed on to us in that resemblance when God made us. In his image. Some people think it's his creativity. Some people think that it is his moral agency. The fact that he can choose between right and wrong. And we can choose between right and wrong. Yes? And last year, 2022, you did a lot of choosing of right and wrong. Amen? We all did. But come down to that choice, and we have the capacity for for great hurt toward others. But we also have the capacity for great love toward others, and that love is real love. It's not based on instinct. We don't just operate according to instinct the way that the animal kingdom might. We make a choice, and there's power in that choice. And there's meaning and depth Behind that choice, we are image bearers of God. We also have been given purpose in this same verse. Can we have the verse back up there? I know I talked a lot about the first part. Notice that he says that that we are to go in and we're supposed to oversee the world and be caretakers of the whole creation. As image bearers of God, we've come in with a very specific role to take care of creation. And notice also it's been given to men and to women. I think that's very important right there in Genesis 1. That this is not just toward men. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And just like God passed his image along to them, they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Yes? They were supposed to have children. And having children they were supposed to pass their image on to their kids. And they're not passing any image on, they're passing God's image on. So he makes them image bearers and says, now go bear images. Make many more image bearers, amen? And some of you have been made more than others, for sure. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. So I'm just going to stay in Genesis here for a little bit. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, I'll just say this real quick. Some of these phrases that we're reading today, volumes and volumes and volumes have been written on just these phrases and what they mean because they're so rich. And I'm just going to scratch the surface of many of them this morning. But you have to take in the image of God himself. And don't ask me how this makes any sense or works. But God himself, like a parent to a child, takes the body of man and breathes himself into his nostrils the breath of life. You say, where did life first come from? Where did the human soul, where did the spark of divinity first come from? It came from the divine. 
breathed directly in to us. How does that make sense? I don't know. But the soul that you have today as an individual, it was given to you by God himself. And those things that are given to you by God cannot be taken away by a man. Amen? And that matters. Then These are the deep things about us. Why can't we just create a person in a lab in our own way? We are not divine. We can continue on the miracle that God has done in us in the way that he's given for us to continue on that miracle. But you have a divine soul inside of you. And that is who you are. Regardless of what anybody has said to you, that is who you are. And it was put there by God. Whew. God's breath breathed into man. Close and personal, parent to child. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Do you know our first job was to be gardeners? Amen. <laughs> some of you have got the green thumb and some of you don't. Some of you kill any plant that's given to you. We got some people in our family like that. I won't name them. I, I love the picture that the first man and the first woman were cultivators of a garden. Do you notice the sword is not in their hand? It's the shovel. And then later on, we get God saying, we're going to beat their swords into plowshares. You see it coming full circle. We're meant to care. We're meant to cultivate. We're meant to build. And so part of our, as image bearers of God, is we were called to build families first, right? Build marriages. Go and build little communities and build churches and build towns and build societies and, and build schools. And we build things, do we not? And this is what we're called to do as caretakers over creation. We were given a purpose, we were given a mission, and we were given a responsibility. Now jump ahead to Genesis 5, 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, and some of you guys know the context of this, so this is going to be after Cain and Abel. He fathered of his third son, actually, in his own likeness and after his image, and he named him Seth. Now I'm just giving you this briefly, this biblical language here in Genesis chapter 5. Because I want you to see that as the first parent has a son, the exact same language is used as was used in Genesis chapter 1. Seth was in Adam's image, in Adam's likeness, just like Adam had been in God's image and God's likeness. So you parents today, you know what it is to have a bond with your child. That bond is spoken of here. There's a connection. There's a link that is powerful. And it is physical. It's like they do have my eyes. They do have my mannerisms, whether they like it or not. They have my strengths. This one has my weaknesses. And we pass that on, and it's part of the legacy, and it's part of the beautiful link that God gives between parents and children. But do you know where that was first born? It was first born between him as a lover of us, him who had a bond to, to us, and then we have a bond toward them. I love that moms actually get to carry their children in their womb. And some of you have had that experience. And when I speak to a, a bond or a link, it goes so much deeper for you. And you know that. What a great blessing it is. One of our kids was born, and I remember being in the delivery room with Linda. And, um, and of course, I was worthless in that room. And I won't, I won't say which baby this was, but one of our babies was born that day. And as, they, as the, the nurses were taking care of the baby, the baby would not stop crying. And one of the nurses looked over at me, and they were trying to clean baby up. And they said, hey, Dad, come over here and just start talking to baby. 
And as I started talking to baby, a magic thing happened that the nurses couldn't do. Baby started to calm down. Baby started to go quiet and to be at peace because baby heard the voice of their father that they had heard daily in the, in the womb. And, and, and baby had my heart forever <laughs> from that point forward, right? <laughs> but there was a love that started, and of course it had started before, but there was a unique love that was there and just there. Say just there. Just there. And, and baby hadn't earned anything. So logically, come on, logical people. Baby hadn't done anything to earn anything. Baby just had it. Just there. Love. Oh, my goodness. I'd jump in front of a bus for baby. Right now. Where's the bus? Show me to the bus. Let's go. It's just there. Value, dignity, worth. Love, just there. They're purple and red, wrinkly and ugly. (laughs) That's not what we're supposed to say. I know. But it's true. We We weren't cute cooing or any of that stuff yet. But it was all just there. There's a part of God coming in and saying... You don't understand. It's just there. With you, it's just there. And you've been taught all your life that I've got to be good looking enough and I've got to be thin enough and I've got to perform enough and I've got to do all of these things for any of that stuff to be there. And it's all been 100% lie. It's just there. Only God could think that up. To say that all of that, it's just there. Our world doesn't function that way. Our broken, cursed world does not function this way. And we are aliens in a broken world. And we have to find the sanity and the light. We have to go to God's word and say, how how was this originally built? How was this supposed to function And the way it was supposed to function is that you matter day one, no matter what. It's just there. But sin came in. That's how we got to this broken world. Some of you know Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve took the fruit, yes? And they used their moral agency and their their ability that God gave them to choose to rebel or to choose to love, and they chose to rebel against him. And when they did, all kinds of things started to break down, and sin came into their hearts. Sin came into the hearts of the image bearers of God. So we're going to put all that together this morning in a, in a very, um, hopefully, clear way. Romans chapter 3 talks about the way that they passed it on to every single generation, that sin and that brokenness that had come into their soul. Romans chapter 3 verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. What a picture That there's venom in your lips. What's it saying? It's saying almost every word that you speak is poison. It's the way that we are. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and, and as soon as I read the last phrase, many of you are like, oh, that's that Romans 3.23 part that I learned in Sunday school. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But go back to Genesis 1. What did we fall short of? The glory of God. We fell short of the promise and the responsibility that he had first put inside of us. We fell short of that in all of our choices. And that's a long list of choices, yes? 
It's a brutal list of choices. But that list of choices sounds a whole lot more like us, if I'm being real. And sounds a whole lot more like the devastation of human history. Yes? It's what we've done. But what's underneath it? Because even the Imago Dei, it's underneath it. Because all those choices that we've made to lie, to curse, to poison each other, to kill and to harm, what's underneath all of those choices that we've made? It's been a rebellion against the Imago Dei in every single brother and sister that we have. It's been taking someone of high value according to God and saying, I will treat you like somebody of low value. You are not worth my truth. You are not worth my love and my kindness and my patience. We, we, we both believe wrong about each other, often because we've believed wrong about ourselves first. And out of that wrong belief that we have about each other, we treat each other accordingly. And it's, it's done so much damage. And what about our own identity? When sin came into humanity, did that remove the Imago Dei from us? Did it taint the Imago Dei in us? Did it darken it so much that it would make it of no effect? So I'm going to show you the answer to this. This is in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. And this comes after the flood. And, and, and very importantly, this comes after the fall of mankind and the curse that came into humanity. And this is part of when, when God's talking to Noah after the flood. And do you guys remember the rainbow? And he puts the rainbow in the sky and he makes a new covenant with Noah. And part of that covenant with Noah is he tells Noah and Noah's family how to treat other people. And this is the way he describes it. He says, for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, he says, listen, if an animal attacks a person, I will require blood from the animal. That's God's justice. And if a person attacks another person, I will require justice and consequence, God says. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. The Imago Dei is still there. It's still there. You're like, but I've screwed up so much in 2022. It's still there. It was just to there in the beginning. And of everything that has gone wrong because of our sin and our brokenness and our selfishness and all of it, there is something about the, the, the value and the worth and the love that God put inside of us, the Imago Dei that God put inside of us, that could not be stopped. Does that encourage you today? It could not be stopped. It's too powerful. I love that. It is too strong. But also, people are uniquely valuable and they need to be treated that way. You know, when dogs fight or dogs kill each other, we don't call it murder. We call it dogs being dogs. And I know, again, I'm messing with you animal lovers here. But when human beings do that to each other, we call it murder. And why do we do that? It's because we are trying to assign value to what's been done against that person's worth. And that's biblical. And when dogs take advantage of each other and they overpower each other, we don't create a dog me too movement, do we? We say that's dogs being dogs. They're following their instincts. But we assume moral agency inside of a human being and we say that's rape and that's wrong. And how dare you? And what's underneath the how dare you for us is the Imago Dei. 
because we are called by God to not only have the value in ourselves, but to treat other people as image bearers as well. There's a difference. When I was about two years old, our family had a dog named Missy, and I was found as a two-year-old little boy to be um, uh, allergic to dogs. And I know I said last week that we got a new dog, but it's a special pool to mix, and, and I've got no allergy to it. Um, not that you need to know all that information about me. <laughs> but when I was two, we had this puppy named Missy, and I'm a two-year-old little boy, and mom and dad find out that I've got an allergy to Missy. And so there becomes a very big fundamental moment in our family. Does Missy go or does Josh go? I don't know how long they thought it over. <laughs> but according to my older sister, every single day she reminds me she would have voted the other way if having, <laughs> having been given the chance. But Missy went to live with our grandparents. But a human being, every single individual matters. Everyone. Everyone. I don't care how pretty or ugly you are. I don't care how old or young you are. I don't care how much our culture celebrates you or doesn't celebrate you. I don't care how whole or broken you feel. I don't care how religious you are or irreligious you are. You're made in the image of God and you matter and it's just there. Every race when a man put his foot on the neck of George Floyd and held it there until he died, and many of us saw that, we were deeply moved, bothered, outraged. There's a reason for that. It is the Imago Day that existed in that man. And this is the way we're supposed to feel. Not just toward people in our own race. We get this wrong so much. We're going to talk about racism next week because this is part one today. Next week, we're going to do part two. Today is you matter. Next week is they matter. Every race matters. Amen? People of God. Amen. Because they all came from the Lord and they have the Imago Dei. People, regardless of their religion, matter. Every Muslim Every Buddhist, every Hindu, they matter. They have the Imago Dei. And their sin or acknowledgement of Jesus Christ does not stop that. Any more than your sin stops it in you. You are loved and you are valued. Every person with a sex or a gender or an orientation, no matter what it is, has the Imago Dei, and they matter. Every age, every, every baby that can't care for itself, any, every senior citizen with Alzheimer's so bad they don't even remember you, can you look at them and say, you have the Imago Dei? You have tremendous value as an independent soul, as royalty before God the Father. It changes the way that you look at people. It's supposed to. Every single day, every homeless person you see, and you're inclined to have an opinion about how they smell. And I get that. But they possess the Imago Dei. They're made in the image of God. And all of a sudden you start to see why Jesus treated people the way he treated them. Because even though we're fallen and we do it wrong, we are a Jesus-haunted world. Because he came and treated everybody the way they were supposed to be treated. Jesus said, don't stop the little children from coming to me. Why? Because they matter. Yes? Don't stop the Gentiles from coming to me. Because they matter. But what about this, this broken prostitute woman? What about these tax collectors? He goes and he has dinner with them because they matter. 
and Jesus over and over and over again. And the convicted criminal on the cross next to him. To many of us, they wouldn't have mattered. But to the Son of God, they matter. Because that's, it's not just the blessing of the Imago Dei, it's the responsibility that we have. Hmm. In Nazi Germany, between 1941 and 1945, six million Jews were systematically murdered. It's one of the darkest moments in all of human history. We're going to talk about that more next week and how they got there. But how did the allied nations come together and form an army and say, we're going to go against Hitler, we're going to go against what we see happening here? What was, their, what was their moral right and foundation to do that, to go against him and to stop him? And you're like, well, that's silly. It was obviously wrong, was it? Because Hitler was a democratically elected leader. And he changed laws. And he brought about policy that was no surprise to many of the people that were around him. It is what Germany decided to do. So how could we, as another state, democratically run state, how could we come against this democracy and say, we don't care if you all got your heads together and agreed this was okay. What moral standing did we have? The Imago Dei. That's the moral standing that we had. It doesn't matter what nation you're from. It, it, it doesn't matter what you've all agreed to. It doesn't matter what the herd all decided was good for the herd. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson. Do you see what he's saying? He's giving you the Imago Dei. And it makes us feel noble to talk about Nazis. Because as a nation, we stood against them. But what about what we do in the realm of so many areas? Just briefly, what about pornography? And it's okay to sit in church and to have a look on your face like this is somebody else's problem. Statistically, depends on what statistics you want to read, 50% of us in this room are wrestling with this on a regular basis, consuming this on a regular basis. I stood at a, at a men's meeting and we had a, a Christian who was a, he had, he had come to Christ and he had been a pornography producer and he looked across the room at all of us Christian men and he had the audacity to say, the reason so many of these people are doing these things is because of your credit cards. In the church. That people are in uh, sex trafficking and slavery. Even the ones that say that they choose to be there, what kind of brokenness has, has gotten them to that place? And they're producing images and they're producing video. And I know this is very uncomfortable stuff to talk about. But do you realize what's at stake here? People use terms like objectification. Do you know what they mean by that? They mean that I'm taking a person that Jesus died for. And I'm treating them like an object that can be consumed by me. And they're not. They're an eternal soul made in the image of God. And that should rattle us. Well, is this the guilt moment of the message? No, it's not the guilt moment. I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm just asking us to think about things differently. I think this might help you to think about things differently in your daily life that you would start to see people that just matter to God and that you would start seeing them again. It might help you. C.S. Lewis said this, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It's immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. So next week, we're going to talk about slavery and race. We're going to talk about men and women. We're going to talk about racial profiling. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, immigration. We're going to talk about foster care. We're going to talk about abuse. And I'm not going to get political. I'm just going to talk about people. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the radiance of 
the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you see the Bible wrestling for language to say, I know you're the image of God, but let's be real. You've not really walked in it. But when Jesus came, he was the exact imprint. He did it exactly the way it was supposed to be done. And he showed it to us. Amen. Not only did he die for our sins, but he showed us how to treat other people. And I'm so thankful for him today. Oh, there's so much. I'll end with this. Because I have to. Dang it. I could go so much longer. For you note takers, I will just tell you, there's a whole passage in Exodus chapter 32, 9 through 14 about Moses. And there's a situation where God makes him into a living parable and asks him whether or not he should destroy the nation of Israel and just start over. And Moses says no. And it, it appears to some people like God might have changed his mind. He didn't change his mind. He asked Moses to see the truth. That these people were not just a group of people. They were individual souls. And you don't just start over with your children. I can tell you today, I don't have between two and five children. I have three children. I know who they are. I don't have a group of kids. I have Jacob and Davy and Grace. And if I were to lose one, it would be deeply inappropriate of you to come and say, at least you've got two left. <laughs> why? Come on. You know why. Because they're my kids and they matter to me, and I know their names, and he knows the number of hairs on their heads. And you matter at that level to your father, and he loves you that much. Last story. Four or five years ago, Jake had had some surgery, was in the hospital for about six days recovering, and Linda and I were there, and we were on a floor in the hospital and over six days, you know, it's like when, when, when your kid goes through something so extreme and so painful, it's like it just really does something to your heart. Have you been there before? It does something to your heart, man. You want to be there every single moment with them. What do you need? What can I do? Talk to me. Even if I'm just going to be here present with you, I want to be here with you. And that's just the, way, it's just the mode that you go into because you love them so much. And I remember there's one day in this hospital and I needed something. I started walking down the hall and this was a, this was a kid's floor. And I remember getting a few doors down and out of the corner of my eye, I see a little kid in a crib, this little toddler in a crib. And he's just standing up there at the crib, looking around, smiling. And I kind of peek in and there's nobody there. It's just a child in a crib. And I'm like, well, that's weird. I wonder where the moms and dads went. And I kept walking down, and I went to another one. And this time, there was a, a kid about two doors down from that one who was crying. And I look in, and there's nobody there. And I talk to a nurse, and she's like, yeah, we've got some kids, and there's, there's no moms and dads. And there's no grandmas and grandpas. And there's one, and her name was Mara, and we, over the time that we were there, got to know Mara, and there was no mom or dad around. And, you know, you see that, and you're like, what does that do to Mara to have a season like that, so vulnerable, and not being cared for the way that she deserves to be cared for. And what does, that, what does that do to her? And that's why I bring that story up. It's not to depress anybody this morning, but just, I guess, just to acknowledge that I can tell you all this truth about how valuable we are as people and the way that God made us to be. But the truth is, some of you guys have got stuff in your past and you're like, but I wasn't treated like it there. And when I wasn't treated like it there, 
it hardwired something into me and I struggle to believe it. And I live as if I, I'm not that valuable. And I live as if I'm trying to just earn it. I can, I can say up here all day long, you're just loved. You're just valuable. You, you just have dignity because God gave it to you even when you were purple and red and wrinkly. But you're still looking back on 2022 and you still know all the goals you didn't meet. And you still know all the pounds that you didn't lose. We were talking about this in prayer this morning before we came in. We could all list out all the things, all the goals that we didn't meet. And we're all still wondering, does that mean I'm low and that I'm nothing? So let me just say again, you matter. And you just matter. And you don't have to earn matter. That was weird. But you know what I mean. Just loved. Just dignity. Just the Imago Day, Because he's good. Not because you're good. Because he's good. Because he made you that way. Because he chose for it to work on day one that way. And oh, that we would get unbrainwashed from all the brainwashing of this life. Amen? Would you guys stand? Hmm. Jesus, I thank you that you did not look at our brokenness and say, I'll start over. You knew us each by name. You know the number of hairs on our head. God, you value each one of us. And God, that's the way you see us today. And, and, and God, I just want to speak one more time against the lies. And Lord, I pray that you would now speak in our hearts against the lies because it's your voice that really matters. And so Holy Spirit, would you come and speak in power into the, the deep place of our hearts right now. And I pray that you would correct, God, what's been broken. Give us new eyes, Jesus, that we would see ourselves differently, that we would start to see every single person around us differently. Jesus, we love you in Christ's name. Amen.